Thank you so much, um, the Barley Art Gallery, for hosting this Lunch and Learn and for the participants for making the time. Um, I really appreciate um, the land acknowledgement um, from the perspective of the, the organization. And Chen and I would also like to provide an extended land acknowledgement. Um, but let me just share my screen before we get into our talk. Is it shared? How do I? Okay. That, yeah, okay. Um, so over the past years, I've been working and thinking deeply about the, um, the dish with one spoon and how to uphold that contract as an individual in my own work and life, particularly as um, a Chinese settler on this land. The dish with one spoon was a law pract practice across Turtle Island, pre-contact that stipulated nations with overlapping territory territories would share the hunting grounds, ensuring that game was left over for others and that the abundance would continue for future generations. The idea of the dish with one spoon is that we all ate from one bowl. Uh, we took what we needed and we left, uh, we left some for others and we kept it clean. It is most commonly known as the treaty between the Anishinaabe and the Haudenosaunee nations that was signed in Montreal in 1701 as part of the Great Montreal Peace Treaty and memorialized by the dish with one spoon wampa belt. The treaty is often cited in Ontario and in the Great Lakes regions, which is uh, the land that I reside on. Um, and while it's exclusively a treaty practice between the Anishinaabe and the Haudenosaunee, I choose to recognize and acknowledge, acknowledge the Dish With One Spoon law as my own social contract that values um, collectivity over the dominance of Western social contracts that value property, scarcity, and individualism. And this way of reorienting my values around the dish with one spoon principle is for me a way of internally decentering white supremacist values that have shaped my unconscious bias as a Chinese settler who grew up on this land. And so to uphold these principles of taking what we need, leaving some for others and caring um, for the future and keeping it clean while recognizing its indigenous roots um, has for me as an artist and as a Chinese settler been a personal method of decolonization. And Chen, if you wanted to share some thoughts about um, your relationship on the Treaty 6 territories, could you please unmute? And then I guess I'd mute for myself. Sure, for sure. Thank you, Nick. And thank you, Annie, for that uh, acknowledgement of the territory you are resided on. And um, and I just wanted to say uh, hi, everybody. And um, my name is Chen. I hope all of you are doing well, as best as possible in this pandemic. And um, I'm very honored to be here and acknowledge that while we're meeting in cyberspace, I'm an uninvited guest currently living on a Muscogee, Wisconsin. Uh, it means a Beaver Hills house in the language of Plains Cree, traditional territory for very diverse indigenous peoples, including the Cree, Blackfoot, Nakota Sioux, Dene, Soto, as well as Métis Nation and many others who are still thriving with pride and resilience despite centuries of colonial violence, genocide, that st still goes on to this day, to this moment. Um, like I mentioned, I'm an uninvited visitor to this land from China. I came to study in this land called Canada since 2014 without an invitation from its indigenous peoples. Um, when I first landed here with my Canadian visa, I was put in a position to embrace the Canadian narrative that erased its darker history and ongoing reality of violence. I have to say that the learning process was and is still a struggle. As much as I wanted to for example, impress other people in the classroom in the Canadian university. As I learn more about the history of Canada, as I learn about 
the indigenous people's resistance and survival, and also the harsh treatment of Chinese early immigrants, Chinese workers, and many other racialized workers on this land, something unsettling was slowly unfolding deep in my heart and in my mind. So I would like to encourage all of us to um, reflect when we hear land acknowledgement here and elsewhere to reflect some questions. For example, what it means to do such an acknowledgement? What are some of the privileges we as immigrants or non-indigenous members of this land enjoy today because of colonialism? How can we develop meaningful relationships with people whose territory we are living on? And what are we or our organization doing beyond merely acknowledging? There are obviously no easy answers to these questions, but we do have two choices in front of us. One is to dismiss them, turn our head away, and stay in comfortable pop bubble afforded by our privilege. The other one is to strive to be accountable in all of our relations with the indigenous peoples and with each other, and embrace the discomfort, try to pursue answers, even though it certainly means uncomfortable, arduous journey of actions. I am privileged and I am lucky with a lot of support from a lot of people. I realize that pursuing the quote unquote Canadian dream is not the only way to exist on this land. And I hope what I do here today continues to be a small part of how I try to live and work an accountable way to all of my relations here. And we are still in a global pandemic where governments of the developed countries have built out big corporations, are living out countless workers, many of them people of color and immigrants in precarious conditions. Many indigenous communities across a turtle island very vulnerable at this time. I hope our gathering today if anything can be a place of reflection, a place of healing, an opportunity for us to collectively reflect on our common obligations and responsibilities to this land, to air, to water, and to other non-human relatives. Thank you. Um, thanks, Chen. I think it's, it's quite important that we um, take a moment to understand, um, yeah, what land knowledge means um, in our personal lives as well. Um, and so before I, um, before I begin, I also want to make clear that this session is not an, uh, a workshop on anti-Blackness or anti-Indigenous racism run by two Chinese people. There are a plethora of, of valuable resources and webinars that already exist and do that work um, much better than what than what Chen and I can do. Rather, in this session, um, uh, I will share the process of reimagining my residency and role as the artist in response to this critical time of the, of the pandemic and in Black Lives Matter movement. And Chen, my collaborator in the creation of a resource, um, will share his personal reflections of doing anti-racism work based, on, um, based out in Edmonton. And then if there are, is there, uh, if there will be some resources at the end of this workshop um, that is specific to those needs, um, those workshop needs. Um, and so prior to the theme, how to be a Chinese ally, as um, Anik mentioned earlier, my residency at the Varley focused on the making of a Chinese home where I had hoped to engage the local Chinese community in Markham about the identity politics felt in domestic spaces. Uh, just before the closure, the residency launched with this exhibition here called um, How to Make an Auspicious Home, which included traditional Chinese shadow boxes, artworks, and other objects hung in the home borrowed from local families. The show was the inaugural event in a series of future um, engagements and social gatherings, including Hot Pot and Mad Jam, as mentioned earlier. 
Um, but with the pandemic, the idea of social gathering would not only change my residency, but also how I thought about home. Following the death of Ahmed Arbery, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and in Toronto, Regis uh, Korczynski Paquette and the Critical Infrastructure Defense Act against the Wet'suwet'en protesters. My interest in identity politics and the concept of physical presence in my work dramatically changed as thousands went against the prohibition of social gathering to protest on the streets, risking their own lives to demand en masse defunding the police and the RCMP. The streets as the public sphere was, as Hannah Arendt theorized, the space of political activities. However, the sense of political unrest felt through a heightened attentiveness to social media in a time of pandemic was intimately felt in the spaces of sheltering. And the desire to gather was sublimated with the desire to do something with what could be done at home. So the central question, however, was what can be done? And the Asian community quickly responded to the question, what can we do? How can we help? And most importantly, what does allyship look like in this time of the Black Lives Matter movement? The question centered almost immediately to the problem of Asian complicity, complicity and white adjacency. Um, to white supremacy, exemplified in the media by Tua Tao's, the Asian American officer who stood by and did nothing while his white colleagues killed George F Floyd. Um, and in his Times article, author Viet Thanh Nguyen described the issue of Tao's complicity as a symptom of model minority. And I wonder if I can move this, if you guys can see that quote there. And he says, quote unquote, while the life of a Humang American police officer descended from refugees is different from that of a stereotypical model minority Chinese American engineer or a Vietnamese American writer like me, the moral choices remain the same, solidarity or complicity, rise against abuse of powers or stand with our back turned to the abuse of power. If we as Asian Americans choose the latter, we are indeed the model minority and we deserve both its privileges and its perils. Okay. Wynn's article was just one of many different responses in the small, uh, small universe of webinars, zines, and guides, and ad hoc collectives, and many Google Docs all responding to the question, how to be an Asian ally in these times. And most notably was a series of open letters to our parents about anti-Blackness that, that has been translated in 19 different languages through, crowdsources, um, through crowdsourcing. And so it became clear from the adjacent Asians for Black Lives Matter movement that the question of the type of allyship that was needed from the Asian community was to do the work of anti-Black racism among our most intimate relationships with our parents, our loved ones, our friends, our families, and people in our community. Or in other words, to do the work at home. So this compelled me to unpostpone my residency with the Varley, slated for 2021, to decenter the concept of social gathering, to rethink my engagement with the Chinese community in Markham, to the Chinese community across Canada, with this call to action as directly related to my original concept of making a home in the context of the Chinese diaspora, but with the question of how to make a home a Chinese home in the context of a white supremacist society. Recognizing the lack of Chinese language education materials, my response was to create How to Be a Chinese Ally, which was first conceived of as a short online zine that then morphed into a much larger resource to be printed and to be distributed, and then now includes a series of future workshops. It is currently incomplete and involving many different players, including T-Based, based in Toronto, uh, the city of Calgary, Varley, and many other collaborators. And yet, as it continues to morph, its intentions remain the same, 
to be a pedagogical tool that not only reacts to the urgency of anti-racism work um, at this time, but a document of deep reflection and critical understanding of race relations that is accessible, simple to understand, reflective of my and other Chinese people's process of unlearning unlearning. And so the residency quickly became a process of um, doing this work. So as an intention was set, a pedagogical framework, however, uh, was still in the making. And the question how to be an ally oops, uh, turned into a series of many questions. Um, how to even begin this conversation within our Chinese community, recognizing that the Chinese community across Canada is a diverse, um, uh, a diverse group of many different uh, immigration uh, immigrants from different times, including myself, I was born here, versus Chen, who uh, is a, a recent Chinese immigrant. And so recognizing that there are many different political positions within the Chinese diaspora here. Um, and also, how does one create the tools to acknowledge and undo the complicity of the model minority complex, particularly understanding that the model minority in the Canadian uh, and the Canadian context emerges out of the uh, multiculturalism myth, which was, you know, for uh, um, which which is really a sort of PR type of um, global relationships making that was intended to build business relationships um, and to globalize the Canadian economy. And so, how do we begin to undo this work of of, of our of of Chinese people being represented under the white supremacist narrative of a model minority. And how does one respond with compassion, but also criticality? And how does one do this, myself, in a language completely foreign to me as a Chinese Canadian born here, um, like many of my generations, I have lost my mother tongue. So how do I even begin this conversation? So, So lots of questions were asked. Um, and so I began by, let me just, sorry, find my notes here. Mm. Um, so lots of questions were asked. And so I began by really um, talking to my friends and seeing, um, who are also artists and seeing what my friends were doing and returning to the question of how to make a home in a white supremacist society. And my attention immediately turned to my friend Fiona Ray Clark, who is a multidisciplinary artist, former lawyer, who works quite intimately with black youth through a theater project called Intergenerational, where her and her collaborators um, create these verbatim plays through the lens of Afrofuturism um, and using conversations between Black youth and Black elders. And so I was fortunate um, you know, to have a friend like Fiona, but also um, to, to interview Fiona as part of the resource and as a document of my own learning. And I just wonder if we have some time. It's 1.30. Okay. So I have, I would like to show um, a clip, but I don't have time for the for uh, the longer clip. So I'll just share um, this um, excerpt of our conversation where I ask Fiona about um, about what it means to be a black artist and why does one commit to the uh, to the work of working in the community with uh, understanding that it is very difficult and understanding that the work um is very specific uh, to a black artist and so i'll just share this conversation i think um as a black artist specifically and as a artist of color more broadly like i don't know if we have the freedom to be like a white writer or a white art white artist and just like 
make for ourselves and follow this and follow that and, and, you know, kind of cut off from who our influence is and say, I did this and it's my success alone and it's my story. Like, I feel like we bring the burden and, and, and the love and the community of our ancestors in everything that we do. Uh, because to me, it's like, I know that I was bred into existence I know that I wouldn't be here unless violence happened to my ancestors. And so to honor that, that choice that they made to survive, to keep my ancestors surviving so that I can be here, I do the work for them. Uh, and I do the work for all of the Afro-descended peoples uh, because I think that hurt and that harm has affected all of us, no matter if you're like a continental African right now. You know what I mean? Like, I think obviously the results of, 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 of slavery have infected uh, and colonialism has, have infected at the way that every black person and every black body is viewed. And so I think that I, as an artist, have to do this work because of like, if, if I don't, like I think that white folks and, and even other communities of color uh, will continue to diminish my humanity and my husband's humanity and my, if I have kids, future kids' humanity and my family and my friends. And, you know, so like, I think it's a humanizing practice um, to make work and as a black artist. Um, and like, yeah, I think if, if, we're, if a certain lens of work keeps occurring uh, and it being allowed to be made without question, um, without our input, um, we're going to keep dying. And we might keep dying anyway, but at least, like Zora Neale Hurston says, if you're quiet about your suffering, they'll say that you enjoyed it, right? They'll kill you and say you enjoyed it. So you have to make that noise, even if it's going into the ether, uh, and hope maybe one day it'll be rediscovered. <laughs> um, uh, because we can't stay silent. We can't afford to. Like, it's life or death. Yeah, it's so, it's such a, it's such a unique passion being a Black artist. Like, I feel like no other, no other, like, uh, artists of color even, or even a white artist can ever experience. Like, there's, it's so interesting because when we talk about survival, we talk about basic material need, but, like, your art practice is also, like, this, like, critical survival like survival tool okay so learning from fiona's practice as a strategy of survival was also a critique about representation and how representation of race specifically of black life is directly related to the violence of police brutality and so i begin to shape a pedagogical framework by thinking about the history of yellow para propaganda during the Chinese exclusionary period of the early 20th century as a parallel for the Chinese community to gain a critical lens of how white supremacy works in the public sphere to represent race. And so here are two examples of images by the bulletin, um, the one on the left, which is an Australian publication from 1886, and another by the Saturday Sunset based in Vancouver, published in 1907. Racism was a time of blatant anti-Chinese sentiment maintained and manufactured by the daily dissemination of propaganda to the illiterate mass. The images, oh no, is my, is that, okay. Um, the images permeated the public sphere to such a degree of normalcy that it continues to be part of the whites, of white imagination of the Chinese race as a recent violence um, in COVID has, um, has demonstrated. These cartoons played a critical role in the anti-Chinese immigration campaigns and the passing of the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1923. While the Yellow Peril cartoons of the 20th century are denounced as racist in retrospect, the Black community continues to be represented under white supremacist narratives today. A clear example are two photographs published by news outlets capturing the aftermath of, Herica, of um, Hurricane Katrina. 
In the first, we see a black youth wading through water, clutching a case of soda and a garbage bag. And in the caption, you can see it saying, uh, um, describing him as looting a grocery store. While in the second photo, we see a white couple in a very similar situation with the caption reading, finding bread and soda from a local store. The violence of representing black youth as thugs is directly linked to the violence black people experience at the hands of the police, in which the presumption of criminality exists before it can be proven otherwise. And often, as the murdering of black lives by police shows, uh, proof of otherwise is sometimes not even granted. And so this connection between the, represent the representation of blackness and police violence has a history that chases back to the period of slavery. And in her book, Policing Black Lies, Robin Maynard describes his contemporary presumption of criminality as linked to a history of runaway, sl slave, um, runaway slave ads. Um, in the book, she says, public association between blackness and crime can be traced back to runaway slave advertisements dating back to the 17th century, in which self-liberated blacks were portrayed as thieves and criminals. All free and enslaved people were subject to the surveillance of a larger white community and law enforcement officials who together scrutinized the presence of black bodies in public spaces as possible criminal runaways. After slavery's abolition, the, uh, the association between blackness and crime served important political, social, economic, and cultural functions in maintaining the racial order and the ongoing surveillance of policing blackness, or quintessential in the late 19th century and early 20th centuries in Canada. These associations with blackness today, while articulated through a slightly different language, like thugs and gangsters, remain, remarked, remain markedly unchanged. Um, end quote. And so continuing to do this work, I realized that um, my perspective as an artist was not enough and that I needed to reach out um, to a first a Chinese speaking collaborator who can do the translation work for me. Um, and that's how I met Chen. And Chen, I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful for my collaboration with Chen because we come from very different, um, that we have very different diasporic backgrounds. Like I mentioned earlier, I was born and raised here. And Chen, who uh, works out in Edmonton and is studying, uh, doing a PhD in the intersection of sports and race at, uh, or sorry, has, has a PhD and is doing a fellowship at the University of uh, Alberta, um, doing your research. And he'll talk more about it. Um, but what I find really valuable about our collaboration is that uh, uh, Chen has challenged me to think about the different types of uh, uh, Chinese positionalities and uh, the different types of readerships and engagements um, that has made the resource guide uh, or the, re the, the resource um, a complete uh, complicated um, multi-voiced um, initiative. And so with that, um, I'll pass it over to Chen, and I think you'll have to direct me in the changing of slides. Thank you, thank you, Annie, and for a very kind word. And um, yeah, if you don't mind, you can uh, move to the next slide, please. So um, yeah, I think as Annie rightly mentioned, the Chinese communities living in Canada is very, very, very diverse, and uh, and me and any the two of us with our, our family history, our individual experience are very, very different. So I'm very grateful of having the opportunity to, to know and learn from many other Chinese diaspora uh, folks, compatriots and brothers and sisters as I continue to, uh, to live on this land. And uh, I'm, I'm grateful for that. So I think today, if I'm going to use my time, I go, I'm going to um, just share a little bit about what makes me uh, wanting to do this work and what are some of the uh, underlying forces that situate myself today to do this work. As I say, there's no other way. It has to be this way. And I want everybody to maybe look at the three keywords here that I put 
I, I mentioned unlearn. According to a, a dictionary definition, is to make effort to forget your usual way of doing something so that you can learn a new and sometimes better way. And second word is a little bit complicated. It's called distanciation. It's a process of producing emotional estrangement and alienation. So last one is relational accountability. Um, Cree scholar uh, Sean Wilson defined it as in the community context, when people demonstrate respect, reciprocity, and responsibility, that is to be relationally accountable. So when I say unlearn, I'm talking about how I have to drop and forget some of the things I learned in the past and find another way, alternative ways of making sense of the reality that's unfolding in front of my very eyes. And when I talk about distanciation, distanciation is a, is a process of Distancing is a process of making two parties distance from each other, alienated from each other. I use that, I, I draw from that concept to describe how when I first came to Canada, I was made not to make a relationship with indigenous peoples living here for millennia, for eternity. So I repeat again, Distanciation, I use it to describe how I was prevented from making meaningful relationship with indigenous peoples here in so-called Canada. And lastly, relational accountability is something that I feel like I need to uphold as someone living on this land, is to be reciprocal, to be respectful, and share the responsibility as someone who is cultivated by its land, its water, its people. So yeah, keep all those three uh, concepts in mind and we will move to the next slide, please. That's the last words you will see. As we can see the four pictures here, they, are, they represent some of the earliest images I have when I consider coming to study in Canada. First one is the beautiful Rocky Mountains. And it's the beautiful, in fact, the, the first national park I went to was called Jasper National Park. And uh, second picture on the right, we consider Canadian higher education provides world-class education and it also prov uh, provides potential opportunities for all students around the world for possible immigration opportunities. And as Annie already mentioned, Canada is proud of its multiculturalism. And for people who are living outside Canada, it's very easy to uh, think, oh, it's, uh, it's a place where different people of different skin color, different racial and ethnic background, they live in harmony. So there's, there's no problem for me to go there and join that bigger, uh, harmonious collection. And last one is the uh, is a welcoming uh, image of the university. And uh, as we uh, came onto the campus, as I became an international student in a Canadian university, I sort of felt welcome and uh, I feel like me as a person of color contributed to its quote unquote diversity. That's a good thing, isn't it? Yeah, so we can move to the next. We'll come back to these images later. And one big public uh, thing that I think um, appeared in my uh, imagination or my or my consciousness was the TRC, Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada, and releasing its final report on the very harsh history of the Indian Residential School of Canada. It's, it's um, 
and its 94 calls to actions. When I first heard about this initiative, and when I heard, first heard about TRC, I was thinking, oh, Canada is acknowledging its darker past. It must be doing something great. And um, that's something that everybody should, should look up to and learn from, including uh, other countries across the world. And uh, with that kind of, kind of uh, relatively a naive impression, I, uh, I collided with the reality I saw on the street, in the city, and in other parts outside of the TRC narrative, the reconciliation narrative. I saw a lot of uh, folks that are impoverished, and a lot of folks are in distress. And, um, and I started to think about why, why there is a huge contradiction, whereas it seems that the official narrative is saying that we, we are reconciled, it's done. And then, and then uh, in other spheres of the society, we, we have lingering issues, we have ongoing um, violences that are happening. So I had to, I had to uh, do some uh, self-study, I had to try to look for answers. But apparently those answers are not easy to get as, a, as somebody who is uh, coming from other countries and you know you don't really want to talk to your uh, white Canadian friends about something that may, uh, may make them upset. So I had to just go to some uh, public events myself. So for example, if you look at the uh, picture at the bottom right co corner is, uh, is an event happening in 2016 at the university where I um, attended. So its title is including the word indigenizing the academy. Uh, one of the three commissioners of the commission came to talk about how we need to move forward and uh, build good relations in the university. All that's good until one, one moment I heard one student came up to the stage and ask why are we what what is uh, indigenizing the academy if i can't see any word in my language in my indigenous language on this campus what are we doing if we're indigenizing the academy i i feel like at the moment i was uh, i was kind of deeply struck i feel like if i am a speaker that use English as his second language, I feel struggling in the university. How hard, how difficult would it be for someone to attend university, but experiencing daily erasure of their culture and their language and have to learn other people's way of thinking. So that's, that was an important moment for me to, to reflect and even looking back on, on my own stay, my own pathway as a student here, I'm, I'm ask, I was asking myself what I was doing here. Should my place, shouldn't my place be an opportunity for some students from the local indigenous community? Um, if you can uh, move on, uh, any please. And then I think very important moment was 2017 when Canada was celebrating its 150 anniversary. We, we uh, on the street, we saw posters like this. I was really uh, unsettled when I, when I encountered such description of the celebration. And then I had to Think about how, how can I learn better? How can I make sense of all of this? And um, because I came to study, I came to pursue my PhD in sport related studies. I'm thinking maybe I can learn a little bit about what all these means by putting myself in a, in a sport event that was organized by indigenous peoples. And here came the opportunity that in 2017, um, 
Several First Nations communities in Alberta hosted the second World Indigenous Nations Games. So Annie, if you can play uh, one of the clips. Do you want me to play which one, this one or this first one? one? Yes, the first one. Yes, if you can uh, also play the second one. Miller, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. So for those who don't know, can you just introduce yourself and tell us why you're here? Well, my name is Winnie Corn Miller and I'm a retired, very retired Olympic athlete. Um, I'm here because uh, Chief Wilton Littlechild asked me, these have been um, his dream for 40 years to have a world indigenous games where we celebrate, you know, our traditional cultures, our, our sports and to bring all indigenous people from around the world together. So when he asked me to come and host the opening ceremonies, I was like, of course, <laughs> can you say no? So that's why I'm here. So as an indigenous woman, how has sport shaped you to be who you are today? You know, I often speak about sport as being more than just a pastime. For Indigenous people, and in particular women, um, it saves lives. It, it builds, it, it, it got me through some of the hardest times of my life, having that focus, having that stress reliever, which sport was for me. It was a way I could release a lot of stress, a lot of anxiety, um, and, and the times of life. We can't escape stress, we can't escape those things, but we need to have coping mechanisms. And sports for me was my coping mechanism. And it got me out there in the world, it took me around the world many times, and you know, it's really given me the, the opportunities and it was just my physical capabilities that got me there and, and a lot of family support, a lot of community support and a lot of encouragement from people like uh, Wilton Littlechild. So now the world came to Treaty 6 territory. How is having the World Indigenous Games here going to motivate the youth that live here? You know, I think the most important thing, and I know it was important for me to see athletes and to see athletes from around the world come to their community. You know, you know, we're here in the middle of Turtle Island and they've come from around the world to showcase their, their talents, to showcase their cultures. That will leave an imprint on every person that watches. They'll take it, they'll walk away with that memory, that good feeling. Sport is one of those things that brings people together, it binds people together, it, it makes us drop our divisions and just makes us come together in a good and healthy and, um, you know, exciting way. So I think that's going to leave a big impact on all who watch. And is there any games that you want to see while you're here? Well, you know, today they had the spear throwing. I think that was the most cool thing to see, um, you know, to see the, the age old spear throwing, which is still amazingly done in so many parts of the world. So that was pretty cool to see. Thank you. If you can uh, move back to the slide. So that was a very important opportunity for me to, uh, to put myself in a new environment and contribute my labor while learning a lot from how indigenous peoples gather their communities and celebrate via a sport event. And, and um, that was the first time I actually got to work with indigenous community members, where, whereas in, in the university, in daily life, I've, I wanted to, but I don't, I don't feel like I was capable of making those connections. So that was a turning moment for me. And as you have heard from Wani Horn Miller, and Wani Horn Miller was an indigenous woman, but also a 
outstanding athlete and nowadays works as a uh, advocate for indigenous communities across uh, the Turtle Island. But from Wanik Miller, who I didn't know at the time, I also learned something more that's beyond sport. If any, you can, you can turn it to the next page. 30 years ago, in, same, in the same summer and fall of 1990, um, Wanik Miller was 14 years old and she was stabbed by a Canadian soldier in, in the last several days of the incident, historical incident called some popularly known as the Ochre Crisis happening um, down the east in Montreal and the city of Oka and the Kanestaki and Kanawaki communities, Maha communities. And uh, Monique Hormiller as a 14 year old was traumatized in that moment. And if not for Monique Hormiller, I would not be able to really to even know what Ochre crisis means for indigenous communities in Canada. That was a assertion of self-determination. That was assertion of their sovereignty as, na as nations in a relationship, nation to nation relationship with Canada. So in that type of uh, learning moment, I was able to realize that within this big Canada thing called Canada, there is something more. There is something both inside but also outside Canada. That's something that I wasn't able to grasp when I first applied the Canadian visa, when I first crossed the custom at the airport, when I first went to the Rocky Mountains and when I first entered the doorway of the university. If you can uh, move on, Annie. A very important chapter of this learning has to come down to understanding the past hidden history of relationships between Chinese people and indigenous peoples. I was fortunate to, uh, to be able to access resources such as, as you can see the documentary title All Our Father's Relations. It was a documentary about early Chinese immigrant workers, as Annie mentioned, coming to Canada indentured as cheap labor, but they were warmly welcomed by the indigenous peoples in the Pacific Northwest, in today's um, area known as Vancouver. And, um, and uh, British Columbia. So being able to access the hidden history of already existing relationship between Chinese and indigenous communities further elevates my awareness that why these things are not taught to me? Why hasn't anybody talked to me about this when I first got here? So if anything, I hope what I will be doing, what I am doing is going to reveal the hidden history and um, yes, help make those history more explicit, more visible. If you can go to the next one. Yeah. So, yeah. If you can unmute yourself. So the short clip you have just watched was a clip um, videotaped in December 2018 when a team of Chinese hockey, female hockey players came down to Enoch Cree Nation just outside the city of Edmonton. They played with the Enoch Cree Nation's Banton, a female hockey team, and they were welcomed they were welcomed as you can see that was a there was a ceremony just like every other sport events where two teams 
stood together and listened to their national anthems. In this case, the Enoch Cree Nation, they have they they play their own um, drums and dance as as a form of their national anthem. They welcome the Chinese team in, and that was the moment that showcase that symbolizes how at certain times people can make genuine connections via sport. And these type of examples of connections exist. The matter is how can we, how do we not know that and how can we make those opportunities of engagement happening more on this territory? and across our different groups. So if you can go to the next one. So here, like I, like I said just, just now, the importance of unlearning, what is trying to uh, impose on me is the notion that this is Canada, this is Jasper National Park. And that, that's, there's nothing more. This is the world-class education you can um, you are afforded to by studying in Canada. This is your possible opportunity of immigration, and this is a multicultural society where you can fit in harmoniously and contribute to its diversity. Again, I ask, whose responsibility is in disrupting this narrative? Who is going to be the bad guy? The pointing out the hypocrisy of this narrative that belies the alternative reality that's unfolding in my own eyes. So with that, if you can go to the next one, I think some important questions that keeps me or guiding me in my, uh, in my work is, is to ask, what other violent conditions that made my visit, study, and residence here possible in the first place? What has prevented me from being in relation with indigenous peoples and other dispossessed communities? And how can I strive to be more relationally accountable as someone living on this land? As Chinese people, Chinese culture, educated us about the importance of being moral, being uh, accountable. Uh, the, the words of Dao and Yi, I think it's obviously relevant in this context. Uh, as we are moving to other people's territory as guests, as visitors, what kind of guests and visitors do we want to be? What kind of existence do we want to have? on this land. And these are just my, um, my personal ex reflections derived from my own observations and experiences. And uh, like I said, I am a highly privileged person to be able to access so many opportunities of learning that may be otherwise unavailable to a lot of people, a lot of students, international students coming here. So if I can do something to change that. I'm happy. I'm happy to, and I think that's my obligation. Thank you. Thank you, Chen, for sharing. I think it's um, really interesting to hear um, our very different questions that we bring into thinking about. Oh, the host has asked us to start your week. Oops, okay. Thinking about um, uh, what Chinese allyship means in the very different. Uh, subject positions that we hold. Um, and so as promised, here are um, a list of other sources for um, uh, that you can continue to continue uh, this conversation with. And I'm sorry that we are a little bit over time, but if there are um, any questions, I guess now is the time that we can open that up. Or what do you, what do you think, Enik? Should we do questions or should we just? Yeah, um, maybe why don't you to kind of, I'll, I'll start, um, ask you a question of, um, about the guide and how uh, you mentioned how it's taken different forms and different um, 
different uh, kind of contexts. But I'm really interested to know how you create a reference material for uh, such a diverse community within the Chinese community, within multiple generations of people and of um, immigration, ways of immigration. So can you talk a bit about that? Yeah, I think that was um, one of the biggest challenges in looking um, at the resources that were already made available, like the, the open letters, um, recognizing that, okay, well, the, the, the type, the readership um, that is targeted is closer to my generation, like my aunt, the, uh, from my, the aunties and uncles and like the, the sort of older generation of Chinese immigrants and recognizing um, that actually this work needs to be done with uh, my p Chinese peers and uh, other, um, the rising conservatism in the Chinese community that is of my generation as well. And so um, recognizing that my perspective was quite limited, I reached out to Chen and to other, um, other collaborators and also to think about um, including, um, including interviews with, uh, with Fiona Ray Clark and other artists and other contemporaries to provide a sort of intergenerational um, understanding and, and voice to the guide. And so the guide is still kind of growing and Chen and I are actually still trying to figure out what is the, what is the right framework. Um, but I think what we are trying to, at the core of what we're trying to do is really to tackle uh, the, the model minority myth, because that uh, is so often used as a way of dismantling uh, and discrediting um, anti-Black racism. I just asked Chen to come back on video. Great. Just wanted you to, if you wanted to um, jump in here. Um, so I don't see any questions I can ask. I have a million. I don't. Um, so I guess like what I'm interested in, um, maybe both of you can can touch upon this is since you have two very different starting point where you're coming from in doing this work. Um, how do you uh, like were there some there's there's so much material. How do you kind of find that common ground? We're still working. I mean, I think it's become quite challenging um, because at one point we really want to talk about systemic racism without using the term systemic racism because we recognize that that's such a hard way, um, hard term to translate, especially um, in, in accessible language, even in the English language, it's so hard to talk about systemic racism. Um, and so we're still thinking about how to frame this conversation. Um, I think we're both interested in, and we both, um, and Chen actually in our conversation, you can talk a little bit more about that, but we both agree that we need to reveal the history of um, privilege of uh, history of um, Chinese immigration and how actually and railway workers and how we actually privilege from uh, the slavery and of of Black and Indigenous labor. And Chen, you mentioned in our last conversation that that was sort of where we needed to begin, right? Or do you want to? I don't know. I don't want to. I, I think you're right in uh, in. In pointing out, Anik, I want to say that it's uh, we're coming from a very different perspective, and uh, I also believe, on the other hand, that we also believe in some very similar things, and uh, that's that's the uh, driving force that makes the collaboration continue. I think it's uh, it's it's more like how we want to frame the resource to an imagined audience, but not so much on how we understand the issue. I think our understanding of, of the issue, while different, of course different, we, are, we, 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 we find a lot of common ground as we both learn from each other, as we are, are both open to, to hear each other's voice. 
So at this moment, as Andy mentioned, I think the, the question is, do we situate racism within the bigger context, the global injustice of colonization, of transatlantic slavery, of land dispossession or not? Because a lot of times racism talks as if racism happens in a societal context that is devoid of history. That you as an individual, you can just change your attitude and everything will be fine. So I think our latest discussion was that maybe we need to go beyond that and, and, and really foreground the issue of racism within the bigger macro level injustice that renders individuals becoming racist. I personally think that that's, that's the approach that we need to take and understanding that people are not born to be racist. It's, it's the societal forces that put people in a situation where, you know, you have to, you have to uh, somehow guard your own interests and then you become racist. So I think that's, that's what I am at, where I'm at right now. So there is a question that uh, dovetails really great into this um, idea of systemic racism. Um, but specifically, Heather is asking, she has a couple questions, but she's asking how the idea or the concept of model, model minority myth um, uh, what's the relationship between that and anti-Black and anti-Indigenous racism? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think one of the um, um, key things that compelled this um, creating of this resource was that many of the resources that are available were uh, written in the context of American, uh, in, in the um, American um, model minority myth. And there is a slight difference, and I would say um, and and um, Ellen Wu wrote this really amazing text, um, and, I, I, and the name of the, the book escapes me now, but she basically traces the history of how model minority was manufactured in the United States during the Cold War as a sort of neoliberal um, uh, PR campaign, again, um, with, uh, with um, with the intentions of showing that America diver American diversity was cool and that we know how to, and that Americans can handle um, their the different racial relationships and so therefore um, uh, uh, let's and and, and, and and with the desire to create uh, these global relationships so it was the model minority went hand in hand with this neoliberal uh, globalization of American markets. And so the difference I would say um, would be strategy. And so Canada did uh, follow suit as it often does with the United States. And I would say the main and the most um, transparent strategy they used was the Multicultural Act in 1985. That was basically, um, there's, and there's lots of great scholarly um, articles about how that act is used as a type of race management um, and how model minority um, emerges from that uh, control of uh, race relationships. And so the, the multicultural acts, you know, it's uh, multicultural, Canadian multiculturalism is all about the mosaic and that we're able to maintain these cultural um, identities and also thrive. And so again, that was a sort of PR campaign to uh, build relationships and attract um, international um, businesses under the, under the pretense that uh, Canada is a cosmopolitan, um, yeah, diverse um, uh, country. And so, so much work, so much work had to go, um, uh, so much like assimilation initiatives, education uh, initiatives had to go against the, the history uh, 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 of, of, of almost a century of anti-Chinese racist campaigns. And so it was a very, um, from, 19, from, from the onset from the Multicultural Act, Multicultural Act, there was tons and tons of money 
um, going in towards erasing that history. And um, so much public education around transforming um, race relationships under, the, under that guise of the Multicultural Act. And so, um, but what's very interesting about that uh, initiative, the government initiative, is that it focused a lot on um, immigrants, mostly. And, and at the same time, if you trace the uh, Canadian immigration policy, you will see that during that, in the 80s, the, um, it, it, um, there was a point system that would allow for immigrants of a very specific class to come. So it was attracting very, uh, very particular type of immigration. Um, and so, so it was really intended to um, attract a type of immigrant. And so you don't see in that narrative, however, black or indigenous people because they're not immigrants. You don't see, they do not fit in the model minority or in the multicultural um, uh, campaign of, of a di diversity and equality um, because simply the global relationships weren't of interest. And so they, and so again, this is a manufacturing of white, of centering white supremacist narratives and race relations. Um, and so that's sort of um, how Canada, I, I would say, um, model minority differs, but very similar to American model minority, although histories of, um, of uh, policies it can be very different. I don't know if that answers the question. I just sort of yeah. I, I think I think definitely, and I think we could we could be talking about this for a long time. Uh, but I'm I'm mindful of the time. It's two fifteen, so I think we're going to wrap it there. Um, unless either Annie or Chen have uh, some last words that they want to say. If not, uh, yeah. So we look forward to seeing um, their project come to fruition. Sometimes uh, this fall. Fingers crossed. Um, I think it's an ever-evolving project, um, so I wish you the best of luck. I think all of us um, uh, over the past couple of months have been thinking a lot about issues of white supremacy and colonialism, um, especially for me in the context of museums, so that's it's a really difficult question that we have to, all of us have to tackle. So um, I thank you both of you very much for your time um, and for engaging with the Varley Art Gallery on these, um, on these subjects. Um, so thank you very much. I just want to remember, remind everyone that the Varley is reopening after being closed um, since mid-March. We're opening on Saturday and information on how to visit um, time entry and um, by we're open both by timed entry and by appointment um, is on our website. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you, Annie. Thank you, Chen. And thank you, everyone um, who's joining us from across the, let's say, the world. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> okay. Bye. Bye.